Thank you guys for all coming and for being here. And I'm Helen Walter. I am a staff member, legislative advocate with Committee for Green Foothills. And since 1962, we have been working to protect farmland, open spaces, and natural resources in San Mateo and Santa Clara counties. Um, through our advocacy, education, and grassroots actions. So the reason we have started doing this is we have, we have always envisioned a resilient region where wildlife thrives and communities are in balance with nature. Um, and what we've started to see is that doesn't always happen in development proposals, particularly in uh, environmentally sensitive areas. For instance, in, and with sea level rise, what, we're, what the projections are are pretty astounding. In San Mateo County, with a three-foot sea level rise, 35,000 houses will be inundated with water. And that's with three foot, just feet of sea level rise. That is not with the associated flooding that comes as well with the rains, which is up to 41 inches when you have um, king tides. Billions of dollars of critical public infrastructure is in that inundation plane. We've got five wastewater treatment plants in San Mateo County. You'd have a public health issue as well as environmental issues if those, um, if they were to be flooded. I live uphill. A lot of my neighbors don't seem to think that sea level rise will impact them. But I like to flush my toilet. Do you guys like to flush your toilet? <laughs> right? It would impact all of us. Um, it would also, SFO and 101 could potentially be flooded. Um, and if you think traffic is bad now, can you imagine? Holy cow. Yet new development continues to be approved in high risk zones. So what is our solution? We need to work with nature instead of against it. Protect our most vulnerable communities that is in the path of the flooding. We should not be putting more people and communities in harm's way. Ask decision makers to make sure that when they allow development, that it, is in, that it will not be inundated. So um, we are working and we have, are starting this programming, educational public outreach to make sure that people know about the solutions and opportunities because there are opportunities and there are great green solutions. Speak to your electeds, you know, let them know that you support green infrastructure and green choices. Um, and who here is a member of Green Foothills? Thank you. If you're not a member, think about, consider becoming a member today. In the meantime, we've got Lenny Roberts here to introduce Dr. Lester. Thank you for coming. We are so fortunate to have Charles Lester giving us a second wonderful program tonight about social, climate change, social change on the coast. We do have two different coasts, kind of. We have the bay and we have the coast, but this is the coast that we're going to be talking about tonight. And um, Charles has been working in the field of ocean and coastal management for more than 25 years. Um, he recently moved to, to the Marine Sciences Institute at UC Santa Barbara and continues to research, write, and teach, and consult about sea level rise, coastal resilience, and other aspects of California coastal law and policy. And he's also the halftime director of the Santa Clara River Conservancy, which is in Santa Barbara. Um, and they're working to protect, restore, and enhance the Santa Clara River. Charles worked for 20 years, um, actually over 20 years, for the California Coastal Commission. And you may have remembered the kind of exciting event where he decided to leave. Or he didn't decide to leave. He did leave. <laughs> it wasn't your choice. Um, however, I think he's in a wonderful position now to do even more fantastic uh, public education research and um, really important policy work on uh, this very, very challenging issue that we have today. So um, in three years, it'll be the 50th anniversary of the Coastal Initiative, which passed in 1972. Some of us here probably worked on that. Did anybody, anybody here 
who, yeah, look at that, yes, Terry, Mike, Sue, Sue, yes, yes. And um, so he's doing a lot of work to get ready for that 50th anniversary, which he may say something about, but you'll, you'll, you will hear about it in the future anyway. He's got some exciting ideas about how, how to celebrate and um, kind of kick off the next 50 years of coastal protection. So in order to do that, he, I just thought it'd be interesting. I asked him, what, what's some fun facts about you? Well, first of all, he has two half-time jobs. And you know what a half-time job really is, don't you? <laughs> he has two half-time jobs. He has two dogs, two cats, two jobs, one wife, and one sophomore in high school, daughter. Now, how he has managing to <laughs> be here and smiling and uh, maintaining his cool, uh, that's probably what we're going to learn a little bit more about, too. So I'd like you all to welcome Charles Lester. I, as Lenny said, I've been thinking a lot about, uh, had an opportunity to, re to reflect on things after um, leaving the Coastal Commission. And uh, I've been thinking a lot about the past 50 years that we're almost upon here, and also what we might have in store for the next 50 years. So in about the next 90 minutes, I'm going to go over about 100 years. Oh, I think I have 30 minutes. So, um, and uh, hopefully we can have uh, some questions or uh, time to talk at the end. And um, the other thing I wanted to say is because it's being recorded, I've taken anything controversial out of the talk. So, <laughs> just, just so you know. Turn off the recorder. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So. Um, as some of you know, which is great, I want to start with uh, our original vision that we had here in California uh, almost 50 years ago, or really 50 years ago, if you, if you think about the run-up to Proposition 20. So this was our initiative uh, that put in place the coastal program that we've had now for almost 50 years. And of course, Prop 20 was uh, a grassroots initiative. And it was born out of frustration and uh, concern about what was happening on the coast with development and losing public access and industrial developments happening where we didn't want them, all kinds of things going on. Uh, the legislature would not act. So we, we took it to the streets and we had an initiative. Um, I just wanted to highlight sort of the vision. I mean, it was a very visionary time and a visionary law. And some of the core concepts there are right here, the people declared that the coastal zone is a distinct and valuable natural resource belonging to all the people. So right at the beginning, it belongs to all of us. Uh, and that the permanent protection of the remaining resources in the coastal zone is a paramount concern to present and future generations of the state and nation. So right at the beginning, we had these two fundamental concepts, that the coast was everyone's, and that one of the reasons we were concerned about it was not just for us, but for the future and future generations. So th these are ideas that I think were, uh, you know, have always been important to animating what we've done under this law uh, for 50 years, but also extremely relevant to what's happening today and what we need to think about for the next 50 years, uh, maybe even more relevant. So uh, under Prop 20, we started this planning process, which uh, probably some of you were also involved in. And we came up with this thing called the Coastal Plan uh, in 1975. And this was uh, done in the first four years under Prop 20. It laid out 162 policies for how we needed to protect the coast uh, and provide for priority uses. And basically framed out this choice at the bottom here. The choice for California in 1976 is this. So shall the coast be abused, degraded, its remaining splendor eroded, or shall it be used intelligently with its majesty and productivity protected for future generations? And that was handed off to the legislature in 1975-76 in order to hopefully make the Coastal Protection Program permanent. And that's what eventually led to the California Coastal Act of 1976. Uh, one of the things about this plan, in addition to the 162 policies, is that it mapped, and this is the, the great 1970s technology, mapping technology, that we had. Every section of the coast was done out in one of these colored maps, and this is the the um, mid-coast here map that was done. You can see how much green there was. And, and if you can tell, I don't know if you can, these orange spots 
those were the urban areas. So Half Moon Bay, you know, was not that urbanized at the at the time. Um, uh, but that was the challenge we had, uh, which I talked about the last time I spoke uh, here a little bit. Um, so we've got the Coastal Act, and what did it what did it do? Well, it was also a very broad law and a very strong law, and it laid out a lot of different substantive areas where we wanted to do our best to protect resources from public access to wildlife to wetlands to agriculture to special communities and views. And we also had a section in there for, quote, priority land uses, so things that have to be along the coast, like boating and harbors and fishing, uh, those uses that can only be on the coast. And I'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, so how have we done with this vision? It was a very visionary plan. Let's protect our coast, and let's do it for everyone and for the future. Uh, it, I want to just highlight a couple areas where I think we have been successful. And some of you have seen these pictures before. But one of the premises of the Coastal Act was, OK, we need to stop the sprawl along the coast. We're going to direct new development into places that are already developed. So this is an example of Cambria in 1972. Uh, the coastal plan that was adopted set out this as the urban-rural boundary beyond which we shall not develop. And those of you in San Mateo County are familiar with that concept uh, in, in your LCP also. So this is what that boundary looks like today or 40 years later. So we were successful. We didn't develop uh, past this boundary. We did a lot of development, but it was all infill, right? So we didn't stop development. We just put it in the right place. And you can go up and down the coast, and it's pretty amazing when you think about it. The footprint, the urban footprint on our coastal zone is pretty much the same as it was when we started this 50 years ago. This is um, Cayucas in San Luis Obispo and Pismo Beach, for example. So you know, pretty successful when you look at it. And it wasn't rocket science. It was, here's the line, and don't go past it. And all it took was a strong agency and uh, groups like Committee for Green Foothills to file the occasional appeal to say, no, that's not right. Um, so it did require oversight and public engagement, but it worked. All right, the second big area, of course, was public access. And the law was all about making sure we don't lose any more public access, that we protect the exact access that we have, and that we make sure that we're maximizing access going forward, providing new access. So again, how have we done there? Well, in the early days, we were pretty successful in the regulatory program. Sorry, I keep hitting the wrong button. Uh, using the regulation process to require offers to dedicate access ways along the shoreline, so both uh, areas of the beach and the shoreline in front of developments, and also what we call vertical access, access ways from the, shore, from the highway to the shore, for example. And a lot of activity in that early period, 1977 to 1985 or so. Uh, then at this point, something happened, which was uh, also put California on the map for how aggressive and proactive it was being with this question. Um, these guys. And one woman came along uh, and said, you know what, California, you're being too aggressive. You're, you're operating outside of the limits of constitutional law. When you require these access easements, you're not making a strong enough argument about why it's required. And so they, they um, pushed back a little bit on what California was doing. And you can see the dramatic drop in how many access ways were required. 1987 was when that lawsuit came out right here. So we have had some. Uh, pushback, uh, but nonetheless, we are still realizing the benefits of these access ways that were required in the early parts of the program. And this is actually the, the case in Ventura that led to that lawsuit. The commission required this as a dedication of access, and the property owner challenged it. But we are still reaping the benefits of that activity. This is a famous case, the Geffen access way on Carbon Beach, so-called Billionaire's Beach in Malibu where the commission had required a, an access way uh, right here from PCH out to the shoreline because of a development that was proposed here. Uh, that property came to be owned by David Geffen, the uh, uh, Hollywood producer. And there was a big fight, 20-year battle, litigation uh, in, in and out of the courts. Uh, he did not want to open this access way. Eventually, um, 
the state prevailed, the access way was opened. Here's what that beach looked like before it was opened and afterwards you have people on it. So a success story, it wasn't easy, it took 20 years, uh, but we were able to do that. And the uh, program in California has been so progressive and so high profile that it's even been um, documented by Doonesbury. Uh, <laughs> over the years, there was a series of comic strips in the middle of this Geffen battle. This is the particular strip where um, Zonker gets um, educated and realizes that mansion owners are a law unto themselves. So in fact, the beach is not ours necessarily, but mansion owners have their own separate legal uh, uh, capacity here. But Overall, you know, our access program in California has been able to get access to places that ordinarily you wouldn't be able to get in, in other states, for example, or other countries. So we've secured access for the public at the Montage Resort in Laguna Beach, at Pebble Beach, at the Fifth Hole. If you've never been down there, you can go and enjoy this beach at Stillwater Cove. You're allowed to be there. There's parking over here set aside for the public. You should check it out. I'm sure if you're a diver, you have checked it out. Uh, and we've even got access at the Trump National Golf Course. So all of these green pathways here are requirements that uh, the golf course had to dedicate to us when they built that golf course. So if you want to go uh, make a statement, take a hike, you can go down to the Trump Golf Course and do that. <laughs> of course, we still have our battles going on, and I assume most of you are familiar with the Martins Beach story. It's not finished. Uh, we've had some back and forth there, and I think the jury's still out on what is really going to end up happening there. But uh, it's, a, it's an ongoing battle uh, to make sure that the shoreline that the Coastal Act set out for the public remains that way, or it becomes that way. Uh, and so stay tuned. The, the um, other area I wanted to talk about a little bit was uh, natural resources and habitat. And so the Coastal Act, again, was a really progressive law. It said we're going to use science to determine what's important. We're going to use ecology, and we're going to protect those things that we identify as being important using our science. This is one example where the Coastal Commission designated almost the entire area of the Santa Monica Mountains as sensitive habitat under the law, uh, recognizing the ecological uniqueness of that Mediterranean climate and that system. So the habitats in here uh, are unique to this particular marine-influenced ecology. About 45,000 of the 50,000 acres in this area were designated as sensitive habitat, and then they get protected accordingly. This is a smaller version of this, uh, one of the cases I had the pleasure of working on right before my departure. Um, you know, maybe that was part of my departure, I don't know. Um, but we identified a lot of um, sensitive habitats on this 400 acre site. All of the color areas here are either wetlands or um, habitats for special species, uh, endangered and threatened species. This is a blow up of this area here showing you after we did that assessment, it, there was about two, 20 acres of so-called developable land in our opinion. If you take the law seriously, if you take the science seriously, that's what you could use for your development footprint. Well, that uh, ultimately got denied by the commission and now there's uh, efforts to acquire that for the public, but we'll see what happens on that one. That was um, Newport Banning Ranch. So uh, you know, when you step back from this dynamic of what the law asked us to do, and you look at places like Bolsa Chica, the original plan identified Bolsa Bay as a wetland, and the policies in that plan said, you know what, it should be protected from development and give priority to restoration over residential or marina development. Over the years at Bolsa Chica, when the Coastal Act was passed, there was a plan to uh, put a freeway through this area, an expanded freeway, put in a new harbor and marina, put in 5,700 homes, commercial development, all in this area. Over the years, that got gradually cut back through the application of the law and the involvement of interest groups to now that we've, only, we've seen about 180 homes, there's not going to be any highway, it's all protected in here, and there's a state restoration plan for that wetland area. So we took the original designation from the coastal plan and worked with it through the legal system to protect it. There is a, an interesting point in this story, which is that wouldn't have happened uh, but for this lawsuit called Bolsa Chica Land Trust versus the California Coastal Commission. So <clears throat> the Coastal Commission doesn't always do the right thing. Right? Sometimes they make mistakes. 
That's a joke. <laughs> um, and so in this case, they approved a development uh, along the way that was going to fill an area that uh, was considered to be wetlands. Uh, and in exchange, the developer was going to mitigate somewhere else. Well, in this lawsuit, the Coastal Commission was sued by the Bolsa Chica Land Trust, and they said, you know what? That's not what the law says. The law says if you have a wetland, you have to stay out of it. You can't, like, trade with other places, right? And so the courts agreed. They said, Coastal Commission, you made the wrong decision here. That's what the law says. That's what it means. Uh, go back to the drawing table. So, but for the Coastal Commission losing a lawsuit to the land trust, that wouldn't, wouldn't have happened. And this is a dynamic that's really critical to a lot of our environmental programs, but the ability for the public to engage, bring lawsuits, challenge the decision makers on what the right thing is or not. And occasionally it's a good thing that the Coastal Commission will lose a lawsuit because it results in protection of the resource. One of the uh, best examples I have of this largest dynamic of what the Coastal Act has done on our coast is perhaps the Hearst Ranch acquisition. Uh, and this was, again, a story where the Hearst Corporation was looking to build multiple resorts up and down this stretch of fairly remote coast in San Luis Obispo. Uh, but the Coastal Commission said, no, that's not consistent with the law. Uh, they denied the pro proposal. This was actually one of the first things I worked on when I came to the Coastal Commission in the late 1990s. Um, and as a result, uh, in 2004, the state of California reached an agreement with the Hearst Corporation to basically buy uh, most of this area with an e put an easement over it for $95 million. I mean, it wasn't cheap, right? Still the largest, I think, public acquisition in the state of California. But all of this area is now set aside to stay in agriculture, uh, and most of the ocean side seaward of Highway 1 in this area was given over to state parks. So uh, in the big picture, a success story when the Coastal Act said, here's what you can do here. Uh, if you can't build the resorts, what else do you do with it? Well, you protect it. You do agriculture. You, you protect it for the people and public access. This is just a quick map I stole off a post web website because you guys are familiar with how successful post, for example, has been in this area. And a lot of that success is due to the interplay of the coastal requirements is that set a new baseline, a new floor for what was appropriate land use or not. And it shapes the market, changed the market so organizations like Post could come in and be successful and buy this land and preserve it. So you guys have a, a great track record here. All right, so this is my uh, uh, Avengers Endgame transition slide. <laughs> Meanwhile, back on planet Earth, after all that great coastal work, um, we have a lot of problems to deal with at a global scale, right? The CO2 emissions are going through the roof. It was 415 uh, yesterday or the day before. Uh, the temperature is going up. The uh, oxygen is going down. Sea level is, projecting, is going up and projected to keep going up. We have the ocean heat content continuing to rise. This is a problem for coral reefs and other uh, marine habitats. We have global fisheries either completely maxed out or overfished, and so we're, we're done fishing. Uh, global plastics are going, uh, projected to continue going out of control, and it's everywhere. I read an article the other day about it's how it's basically in the air we're breathing, these microparticles of plastic. It's so pervasive. And then most recently, just um, last week, in between the time I gave this talk and, the, and tonight, I added another slide, which is global extinctions. It just came out from the UN program about how they're projecting all of these extensive extinctions across the globe if we don't change what's going on. This is the slide that I'm sure you've all studied very closely. Uh, that was the origin of the headlines that we have 12 years left, right? uh, a few months back or in the fall. Um, and now it's 11, I guess. Um, but basically, what the slide shows is that if we don't have on the order of a 45% reduction in CO2 emissions, or about half of everything that we're doing that emits CO2, it's unlikely that we'll be able to stop getting to a uh, three to, uh, two degrees uh, overshoot of what they're projecting for global warming. And so the wisdom, prevailing wisdom, is that we need to stay at one and a half degrees, but that's going to be increasing, increasingly unlikely unless we can do this 45% reduction by 2030. That's where the 12 years and 11 years came from. 
right? So um, it, the global trends are showing we need, to, we need to take a step back and do something more serious. Social trends. I know there's some question, what, what was I going to talk about? Well, California's population continues to increase, uh, although the last most recent report was that we've kind of uh, leveled off for the time being. But that's where we are right now at about 40 million. And population, of course, was the core driver of all of these concerns we've had on the coast. We're getting increasingly diverse. And we still like to live along the coast. So the population is most dense along our coast in our coastal zones. And then in terms of the distribution of income, we've heard a lot about how that has really uh, changed a great deal in the last uh, couple of decades here. Uh, and now this data shows that we're at levels of uh, the maldistribution of wealth or increasing difference between those who have and those who don't have uh, on levels not seen except back in the 1920s. So we're in an equivalent space in terms of who has the wealth and how it's distributed. And this is creating issues, um, including on the coast. So what does that mean for the coast? Well, let me give you a couple other stories. Uh, a few months back, the Coastal Commission was faced with a, a project to uh, restore a wetland area that is currently in oil development uh, with the idea that the Existing oil wells would be pulled out, consolidated, and put onto these smaller parcels. And the rest of this area would be restored as a wetland. That's the area right here. Well, first of all, you can see that we did a real number on this place already. This is the historic extent of the wetland uh, down at Los Cerritos, um, all developed, mostly developed. And this was the projection of what might happen here with sea level rise in the area that was being proposed for restoration. So like many of our coastal wetlands with sea level rise, it's projected to essentially become a mud flat because there's nowhere for the wetlands to go. And I know you've probably heard some of this um, dynamic in the bay also. So as the water gets higher, you're not going to have any more marsh. Uh, you're going to have mud flat unless you can somehow provide for that marsh somewhere else. Uh, so notwithstanding, the Coastal Commission approved this project. And there was a close vote, a very controversial discussion. And the, the discussion revolved around, should we really be pr approving more oil production in this place with what's going on globally with CO2 emissions? Why are we, producing, why are we approving a project that's going to result in an increase in oil uh, production and use? Well, the Coastal Commission decided to do that. But the, the reason they did it was because there's this provision in the law in the Coastal Act, which was not perfect, um, that, well, maybe it was perfect at the time. But you remember in the 1970s, we were in the middle of an energy crisis, right? So the Coastal Act has this provision that provides for oil and gas development. If you can make certain findings, including that it's in the, uh, to not do the project would adversely affect the public welfare. So the Coastal Commission staff uh, and the adopted findings of the commission in that project did conclude that that project was not consistent with the Coastal Act. However, they used this so-called override to approve it anyway because they determined that not approving it would adversely affect the public welfare. So they did a balancing and said, you know, we'd rather have wetlands restoration that might go underwater uh, and, and allow the oil development instead of not doing the oil development. So that's uh, in the law right now. Well, what's, what do we do about that? Well, my suggestion is to just take it out, right? We're not in the 1970s anymore. We're in a global crisis. CO2 emissions are going through the roof, and we have to get off oil. This is an example of a picture I couldn't show if I was still working with the Coastal Commission. <laughs> but this was uh, the 50th anniversary of um, the Santa Barbara oil spill. They had a little. Uh, exhibit at their archives. And so they've asked people to hold up the sign on, on the wall of activism uh, to get off oil, right? So we need to get off oil. All right, uh, housing. A lot of talk about housing in California. This is the median home value in California over the last 10 years. Uh, you can see it's going up, keeps going up. It's an issue. This and don't think that, um, if you do think we're special in California, you'd be right. Uh, the home values in California are a lot higher here than they are elsewhere, 
even though they are going up elsewhere. And so what was the original vision that we had under the Coastal Act? Well, the original vision of what it meant to have public access in the coastal zone was that it included housing. And so these are right out of the original statements. A vision, well-maintained, older, less expensive housing that provides opportunities for people of all incomes to live near the ocean. Equality of access, increase housing for low and moderate income persons, give priority developments that provide lower price units, protect existing lower costs. And we even had the Coastal Act with the policy that required lower cost visitor and recreational facilities and housing opportunities for persons of low and moderate income. So that was in the original law in 1976. We believe that access is not just getting down to the beach, it's being able to actually be in the coastal zone and live there and enjoy it like everyone. Uh, everyone should have that opportunity. And under that provision, the guidelines came out in 81 that said meaningful access requires ho housing opportunities as well as other forms of coastal access. Between 1977 and 81, the Coastal Commission, sorry, Coastal Commission approved or required 5,000 affordable units through inclusionary housing. If you know what that is, that's a requirement that when a development gets built that some of it has to be affordable, has to actually be built, no in lieu fees. But they also um, protected the demolition, uh, prohibited the demolition of existing affordable housing. And they did require over $2 million in in lieu fees for affordable housing. So the Coastal Commission took that provision of the law seriously. They implemented it. And what do you think happened? Uh, well, everyone said, wait a second. That's not what we meant. You know, We don't want to lose our tax base to requirements for affordable housing. And the developers don't really want to actually build the affordable housing. Uh, we'd rather just pay an in lieu fee or let the market do its thing. So the legislature removed that requirement from the law in 1981. And they also added a section to the LCP provisions that say no local coastal program shall be required to include housing policies and programs. So we said, okay, forget it. Experiment's over. No more inclusionary housing. Well, so what have we seen as a result? Well, I, in my 20 years at the Coastal Commission, I saw a lot of this. Um, existing houses, they get bigger, better, stronger, and less affordable. Right? Those houses there uh, were, Zillow was saying, were uh, one in the middle is $8 million, 5.4, 2.94. This, this is a section of coast in Santa Cruz County. And so we have a lot of concern about equity now within, or the lack of equity along our coast. You can see that inland areas are, by this study, shown to be more diverse, less uh, well off. So in other words, the coastal zone is more wealthy and less diverse. And that, you know, we all see that happening and I've watched it, uh, the gentrification along the coastline for 20 years. This is Venice, 1972 to 2013. You can't really tell a whole lot about what's happened here, but a lot of redevelopment over the years. Um, this was the 2001 land use plan. They haven't finished their LCP, but in 2001, they uh, did get a, an overarching plan approved to set out what the character of Venice is that we're trying to protect. And here is that statement of what Venice is. Venice remains the quintessential coastal village where people of all social and economic levels are able to live in what is still, by Southern California standards, considered to be affordable housing. Diversity of lifestyle, income, and culture typifies the Venice community. That's what we were going to try to protect in Venice. Well, you may not have followed it that closely, but I lived it for a number of years there. Uh, this is, again, our median home value in, in California. When you start looking at the coastal zone and comparing the whole state to the coastal zone, that curve gets pretty flat. Here's the state, right? This curve here, this is Venice. And uh, here's Half Moon Bay. You're almost up with Carmel in Half Moon Bay, uh, and that's Pacifica. So going up, but in the coastal zone, it's going up even more than other places. So we haven't really protected that vision of Venice as a diverse and affordable place. Uh, however, um, it doesn't look so bad uh, in Venice if you put it against Stinson Beach. <laughs> so that's adding Stinson Beach at the top here, which is, I think, maybe one of the least affordable places in terms of this index. So it's all relative. 
All right, so for, to me, this question is, is, has the coastal zone become an economic border fence right, to, uh, for our, our people? Right? Who's able to be in the coastal zone or not? That's the actual border fence that um, the commission tried to deny and uh, was overridden by the federal government. So there's been a lot of talk about this problem. And this is a diagram maybe some of you saw a few weeks back out of the San Jose Mercury uh, diagramming the current housing bill that's pending and how it would work <laughs> and what, what the different criteria would be for increasing densities in our various communities. Um, you can see here, what I've circled is most of our coastal places that aren't in Southern California would be exempted from this provision. So communities like Half Moon Bay, under 50,000 people, I think Pacifica would be also in that box too. Yeah, so you know they've put in a provision to not apply this law to the coastal villages that we have. So it doesn't really address the problem that I'm talking about. Um, but I do think one of the things we need to do, just like getting off of oil, we need to take seriously this problem and figure out how to embrace housing programs and policies that are going to increase densities if we want to maintain our coastal resources in the same way and still provide for people to be here, uh, unless we're going to just shut the gates. And as far as I could tell, we, California has not said that's who we are. We are not, we're not shutting the gates at the, in the larger debate that we've been having. And so we need to think about what that means for the coastal zone. So last uh, big challenge, uh, climate change, sea level rise. Every time we turn around, the new studies show that sea level rise is going to be worse. So the last projections from the state, we even have a scenario where there's uh, 10 plus feet of potential sea level rise. We were just hearing about three feet, three and a half feet. Uh, six feet is the high end of the projections in California. And 10 feet, depending on what happens with the ice. And there's a lot of uncertainty there, what may or may not happen. If the worst case scenarios unfold, we could see up to 10 feet of sea level rise by 2100. Um, you know, so that, that's three times as many houses probably that you were talking about uh, that are affected. We have studies coming out showing the submergence of about 83% of our vegetated wetlands by 2100. All of our coastal wetlands, there's no place for them to go really given the topography. And so if the sea level rises, they're going to be underwater. Uh, become mudflats. 55% of our current total habitat area highly vulnerable to five feet of sea level rise. Two thirds of Southern California beaches might disappear by 2100. And think about how important those beaches are to our economy. So this is one example. This is a projection of the shoreline um, at Bolsa Chica Beach, State Beach. This is 2047 with 52 centimeters, half a, half a meter of um, sea level rise. That's where it goes with, by 2075 with a little over a meter. Uh, and by 2100 with two meters of sea level rise, you're six feet, you're right at the highway there. So there is no beach in 2100. A lot of people would also argue that, well, we need to do beach replenishment. That's one of our green uh, infrastructure ideas, right? Well, you add beach replenishment in here and basically what it does is slow down the inevitable. And it costs a lot to do that, right? So you're gonna dump a lot of money into sand uh, and eventually you'll be overtaken by sea level rise if the shoreline can't move. This is the flooding in that same area. So um, in terms of the projection of what might happen with sea level rise and inundation, we've got a lot of serious issues in places that are low lying like Bolsa Chica. So, but this problem, and this, some of this I talked about the last time, we basically inherited this problem and, and it's a difficult challenge. By the end of the 1960s, when we were starting to talk about a coastal act, a lot of our coastal uh, urban areas had already built out. This is Santa Cruz County between uh, the end of World War II and the late 1960s. This is Belmont in 1972. You know, as you can see, we've pretty much already constrained ourselves. Uh, same in Huntington Beach. Uh, and we also built in a lot of really dumb places, right? For, we like to build on sand spits and at the mouths of rivers and in front of wetlands and all these places that are inherently hazardous and that are going to uh, be subject to sea level rise. Here's our most valuable community in the state and the coast, right? Stinson Beach on a sand spit. Let's see how that works out. We've also done a... <laughs> 
You know, so the really uh, one of the great things about the Coastal Act is we successfully concentrated new development. So one of the bad things about the Coastal Act is we successfully concentrated development along the shoreline. Here's the Imperial Beach. You can see in the space of 40 years, we gave ourselves a lot more sea level rise uh, managed retreat challenges, including building this, approving and building this hotel in the late 2000s. And we were, we were talking about sea level rise at the time that this hotel was approved and built. And you, here's place probably most of you are familiar with, Princeton by the Sea. Um, we did a pretty good job of providing some infill right in the most vulnerable area. Although you can see that we, we did maintain the urban rural boundary, right? We, we didn't sprawl out, haven't developed the airport yet into something else. Um, but we did a good job here of making sure that we had a problem to deal with. This is Malibu. Uh, between the 40 years, we basically finished the job of uh, building in the rest of the houses. And so the, what is going to happen here and what we haven't been able to push back on are seawalls because they're uh, basically, it's a long, longer story, but there's a grandfather clause for existing development. And where you have developed urban areas like Solana Beach, we've seen the gradual conversion of natural shorelines to seawalls. Uh, because that's what the law provides for. And so this beautiful geology, if you've ever been down there, there's still some left. These amazing cliffs are becoming this like Disneyland, you know, landscape, this faux textured colored wall. And this beach will disappear because it doesn't have anywhere to go. This is an example of what happens when you fix the shoreline and what it does to the beach. Monterey Beach Hotel, pre-Coastal Act project. You can see how narrow it is here. This is where the beach would, would be if that hotel wasn't there. This is from Moss Beach. I think I showed this one last time. A very clear example where you have a beach in 1972. We put revetments here and here to protect these houses. Uh, we didn't put one here, I don't think yet. Not, not yet, okay. Um, this was today, and you can see what, there's still a beach right there, right? Because the, the shoreline has been able to move inland as it wants to do naturally, but not where you have the revetments. So we know what's going to happen when we do this. We, we, the science is, is there. It's been there a long time. This is Pacifica in the early 1970s. You could walk that whole stretch. This is some of that stretch today, the change. 1979, nice, nice beach there. This area is still undeveloped, but we put in revetments to protect these apartment buildings. You can see, the, and there's a little revetment here to protect this access way. Where you have that revetment, the beach has disappeared. You still have a beach where it's been able to regress or um, recede inland, uh, but that's inevitable wherever you have that dynamic. And so I th threw these slides in again because they're just, <coughs> you know, scary and entertaining to watch. This was the, what happened in 2009-10 uh, at Land's End in Pacifica, uh, which was a particularly rainy season. Um, keep your eyes on the two dogs. They're gone. Uh, so they lost up to about 90 feet of land in the space of uh, a weekend or a week, basically, because of saturation and then erosion from, at the toe of the bluff. Um, but we all know what it can be like. It can be very catastrophic and episodic. And so you can try to plan for this, but if you aren't way ahead of the game, you might end up in a situation like this. So we've spent a lot of time in Pacifica struggling to repair things. Uh, we've had rocks uh, down on the beach in various places. But basically what's happened at, on, along the Esplanade is that We've moved our equipment from the bottom of the bluff in an effort to protect things uh, to the top of the bluff, de demolishing things in order to get them out of harm's way. These buildings were red tagged as no longer habitable. And so we have seen some retreat in Pacifica. It's not planned. It's unplanned retreat. But it's, in, it's happening. And they have a particularly challenging, as some of you know, some of the most challenging geology in the state, basically these very high, pure sand bluffs. So you're not going to stop those bluffs from falling away. The question is, what are we going to do about it? And what's the most effective 
investment for uh, the community and society there. This is what that looks like now, so unplanned retreat. Uh, we have tried to make an effort using things like setbacks. This is a subdivision that the commission approved in Pismo Beach. Uh, compared to the existing pre-Coastal Act development, the commission said, okay, you know, we know what's gonna happen. Why don't you get a little further back? Uh, there's, a, there's a good idea. Um, we've used uh, requirements, legal requirements on lots of permits to say, okay, you can build here as long as you set yourself as far back as you can, you assume the risk, you record a deed restriction to say, I'll never build a seawall, and there you can have your house. So that's something the commission started about 20 years ago. This so-called no future seawall condition has not yet been tested in court. Uh, so the question is, is, is retreat feasible in some of these places? And I think we are gonna see more cases uh, where this issue is put front and center and probably in the courts. And I know some of you have already shown it to be feasible in the city of Half Moon Bay, uh, where this is um, the old foundation, the original foundation of the Ritz Hotel, uh, which was removed uh, a year or so ago, maybe. And this is the, these are shots of the crane, credits to the city of Half Moon Bay, I think, for these photos, um, removing that old foundation. Uh, but the hotel itself also has a very early version of a condition that the commission required that seems to say that the hotel also has to move back. So there you go, Lenny. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and we have other hotels like the Bacara in Santa Barbara and the Cliffs Hotel in Pismo Beach, which have similar requirements. So I think we're gonna see some future legal battles about whether or not this actually has to take place, whether it will take place, uh, when those places become inevitably at risk or endangered. So we've spent a lot of time in the last five or so years talking about what our alter alternatives are for this kind of threat. Uh, we've talked about retreating, um, for example, Stillwater, um, Stillwell Hall in Monterey County, where we took out a revetment and the beach has restored itself. It you know, took care of itself once we took out the revetment. Uh, we've talked about accommodating, like this house at Stinson Beach. Well, let's just raise our houses up. And we know engineers can do just about anything uh, if you ask them to. Um, or we can protect, and we know what happens when we protect. So those are the three types of approaches we've started to talk about. Uh, the green infrastructure is a variation on these themes, I think. It's sort of a soft protection uh, strategy, which might gain us some benefits, of certain kinds of benefits in the short run. Um, and then we've also talked about beach replenishment. And so communities are asking these questions. Do we defend, elevate, replenish, or retreat? In places like Del Mar, uh, they said, no, we're not gonna do that. Um, they reluctantly add it back into the LCP. And in Pacifica, of course, we have no managed retreat, not for homes, not for businesses, not for Pacifica. So I think that we still don't know what's going to happen in Pacifica, right? And that's not the city doing that. That's the right, no, it's not the city. Uh, it's in the city. It's uh, re residents opposed to this concept or uh, people opposed. It's not sure. Not, right. But you know, that's understandable, right? As we already talked about, the real estate values in California are unreal. Some of the most expensive shoreline real estate in the world. This is uh, Broad Beach in Malibu. The average home value is $10 million. So of course people are gonna wanna protect that, right? It's, it's valuable stuff. This is a representation of what Broad Beach has proposed to do there. If you know that story, they faced an emergency situation and their beach is no longer broad, it's gone. They threw down an emergency revetment across about 100 homes there. Uh, and then, this is the revetment that they did, emergency. You can see the beach is pretty diminished. Now there's really only the ability to walk along here at a very low tide. They proposed, to their credit, they, form, they formed a geological hazard abatement district, which is a governmental entity that you can create. They all agreed to tax themselves to bring in sand, replenish the beach, and make a dune covering of the revetment. Well, that's what they proposed. 
Uh, I was at the staff table when the commission approved it in 2015. It's still not happened. This is what it looks like today, basically. Uh, there's been litigation. There was, they couldn't find sand. Then there was litigation from the communities because they were going to truck sand. And the community said, why do we have to deal with all of the 40,000 truck trips for your broad beach? Uh, homeowners themselves have now started to fight with themselves about the assessment, which continues to go up. There are about $50 million now for a 20-year project. It started at $20 million. A lot of problems. But to me, one of the biggest problems with how we're dealing with this is the environmental justice question. The one day I was down there, this is what I witnessed. Some kids or younger people coming to enjoy the beach, they go up to the stairs, they see this, and they turn around and leave. Right? There was no beach. This was the public access way. So we need, we need to start visioning you know, and, and imagining some alternative futures for our communities. And I know we have a really good uh, ability to have a vivid imagination and to use our imaginations. This is a scene from, if any of you saw that uh, Blade Runner 2047, which is a, you know, the next iteration of that Blade Runner movie from the late, early 80s. Um, this was the Sepulveda seawall, what they call the Sepulveda seawall, right? And there's, a, there's about a five minute scene where this occurs in the movie. Huge, massive seawall. And if it's a Sepulveda seawall, that means it's going along Sepulveda in LA. So the vision of that particular creative mind was that we're gonna have this massive seawall about right here in the city of LA in about, in less than 50 years, right? Probably, maybe not that soon, but. Or is this what we're gonna have? Is this gonna be our beach environment where we come to the beach and we sit under elevated houses so our vistas are, you know, we have shade, that's good, I guess, if you're concerned about the skin, your skin cancer. Um, and then the final version of this is, well, what about the public trust? And in California, we're a public trust state. All the lands below the mean high tide are public. So part of our, our emphasis on protecting the beach and providing access to the beach is because we recognize that's a public trust resource. But what do we do when the public trust, which is gradually marching inland with sea level rise, comes under these houses? And what is the answer going to be when those houses are on our land? I don't, I, I don't have the answer for that right now. This is just one other example at Goleta where I've been spending some time now. It's in Santa Barbara looking at this beach. That shows you how the beach basically disappears. This is a tremendous community resource. It's a free beach resource. Um, a lot of people come here to enjoy the beach, but it's projected to be gone. Um, in fact, this is much wider than it's looked recently. But there's a larger dynamic happening too that we need to start thinking about, which is how, does, how do the beaches relate to the sand supply and the sand flows? And some of you probably know about what happened in Montecito uh, a year or so ago with the mud flows. Um, you know, a real tragedy, but there was a question about what do we do with the debris that came from those flows? Well, they made an emergency decision to put it on the beach at Goleta. Um, this is how they did it. They pushed the dirt basically out into the, into the ocean. I watched this for three months or two, two months, pushed a boatload of sand and, and dirt. And as it turns out, rocks, <laughs> which uh, this is now at Goleta Beach. And this is the beach that has formed behind this mini groin that basically was created through this action. So you know, I'm still kind of pondering this whole thing because <laughs> it was a Coastal Commission emergency permit. and. It's not ordinarily the kind of thing you would, you would see, but basically it created a little berm and it created a beach. Uh, I don't know how long it'll last, but you can see the difference between where the groin is. Here's the beach. And this is the, you know, it's very narrow down coast of that. Anyway, so an interesting little experiment uh, because of that tragedy that happened. One other success story. I'm, I know I'm probably close to wrapping up here. Um, this is in Pedros Blancas in uh, the Hearst Ranch, again, in San Luis Obispo County. And granted, this is a place where there aren't any houses behind the, where we wanted to retreat. But it's a story where Caltrans came 
and um, this was a career-defining project for me. I worked on this permit in 1998 when the highway was in danger from erosion. It was starting to fall in, and the Caltrans said, we need a revetment to protect the highway. And we recognized Highway 1 is an important coastal access resource, which it is, and transportation resource. So we gave them emergency permits to do all this. Uh, but we said, you know what? We'd like you to start uh, planning to move the highway back. And they said, well, that'll take about 15 years. And we said, OK, let's get started. And we required them to do a check-in every five years. And we did another permit five years later. And then we did another permit five years. And in 2014, we approved the permit to move the highway back. Uh, and Caltrans was um, great. They did the planning. They figured out this is where we need to put the highway to be safe for another 100 years. They moved the highway back. This is the old highway that they took out. You can see the new alignment here. This is the, where the highway was. Shoreline has already started to restore itself. This is going to be the future coastal trail, which State Parks has agreed to take over. So a win, win, win all around. Um, and so we can do it if we plan it, right? It's a 15-year project. It, you know, I didn't think there were such things as projects that would last your whole time at an agency, but this was one for, for me. Um, anyway, so it's a good success story. I put this one up there because this is when I went down to check out the status of this. This, this uh, I don't know if it's, I guess it's a guy or you know, it's a elephant seal. Um, was looking up from the beach that's being restored here, and so we also have to grapple with that challenge in California, which is access for which species. And I experienced a number of stories up and down the coast where that's the conflict. So we might make a huge effort to restore this shoreline, but it might not be for us. Right? It might be for animals that need to be there, uh, like a children's pool in San Diego. We do see evidence of success with managed retreat or planned retreat in, on the East Coast and other places where they've been confronting this flooding and sea level rise a little more directly than us. Uh, post Hurricane Sandy, we've seen investments, $120 million, uh, to acquire 300 properties in Staten Island. And post um, Hurricane Sandy, taking it out of this wetland area, these houses here. Of course, $120 million would get you 12 houses at Broad Beach. Uh, we've also seen some success in New Jersey, um, 1,000 buyout offers. Since Sandy, 713 have been accepted. So that's pretty amazing. You think about it. 713 people have agreed to be bought out, to move out of an inherently hazardous place. So you see the market starting to adjust where it's more threatening. And I think that'll happen in California, too. At some point, it'll just become not worth it, except in those places like Broad Beach, where there seems to be an unlimited supply of investment and capital. People will pay for, you know, I don't care if I have it just for a year, but I'll pay it. And we're seeing at the state level in California uh, the recognition that this is big money we're talking about. So bills are pending to um, require, this is the um, redo of the concept of redevelopment you know, that we got rid of a few years back, but now thinking about a different way of investing, uh, including protecting communities dealing with the effects of sea level rise. So if something like this comes through, we'll have more public monies to invest in um, projects like planned retreat, presumably. And this was Prop 68, which we did pass. And you may or may not know that uh, it included $443 million for available for projects that plan, develop, and implement climate adaptation and resiliency. So we have recognized that we need money to do this, and it's going to take public investment, just like we invest in a lot of other things. But we need to get started on that. So. I'd just like to close with this quote, which I take from Jane Jacobs, who was an urban city planner. Uh, I just stuck in shoreline instead of uh, city. Designing a dream shoreline is easy, but rebuilding a living one takes imagination. And that's what I think we're going to need if we're going to last the next 50 years. Thank you. Thank you.